Welcome to another edition of One on One with Ms. LaFauna. Joining me this week, Steve Thompson, who has produced and mixed some of my favorite albums and some of the biggest albums in rock metal history, including Mechanical Resonance by Tesla, an all-time favorite of mine. That album just never, never gets old. Um, another album by a little tiny band you might have heard of. Uh, it's believe I, uh, I think they're called Guns and something. Guns and Roses, right. Uh, Appetite for Destruction. He had a hand in that. And then there's this other little band, I, I, I think a bar band out of the Midwest called, well, uh, Metallica. And uh, he mixed, or infamously mixed, the Injustice for All album, which, of course, fans around the world will say, hey, uh, wasn't there a bass player in the band at the time? Uh, yeah, they they mixed it and whoops, uh, forgot the bass or uh, toned it right down. And so uh, Steve explains what happened there. Where did the bass go? And certainly uh, says, hey, don't point the finger at me. I was just doing as I was told. And with that, here is Steve Thompson. We are speaking with producer and mixer Steve Thompson. Uh, Steve, pleasure to have you today. Absolutely awesome to be here. By the way, you're in Montreal? Yeah, good old Montreal. My favorite city in the world, bar yeah. none, outside of Paris. <laughs> yeah, well, Paris is a great city, but Montreal Montreal's fantastic. It, it's sort of New York meets Paris put together. You've got the best of America and the best of Europe sort of combined in, in, in one great city. Um, well, you're preaching to the choir because, again, I spent most of my life in New York, and I spent a lot of time in Montreal working and exploring Montreal, and I absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah, it's a great city. So let, let's get right into this. First of all, when I look back at your discography or certainly albums you've been involved with, you really haven't missed anybody, whether it's Blondie, Billy Idol, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, Korn, the Rolling Stones, even Kiss with uh, the track Forever. Uh, you've been everywhere, ubiquitous. Um, talk to me a little bit about working with the different genres of music. Do you prepare yourself differently to come into a Blondie session than you do a Metallica session? Absolutely. Well, again, the reason why I do a lot of different types of music is that's what I'm personally into. I never wanted to be typecast in music because, you know, my goal is that each artist I work with, I want to make them special. I want to keep their personality and at the same time let them grow as artists. And uh, I found myself, I would get absolutely bored if I did the same thing. And what's interesting about my career, every time I do something that just blows up, you know, whether it be corn, then I get 50 million bands to try to want to be like corn. Um, you know, they come up to me and I says, well, unless you could top them, what's the point of doing them? I've, I've done the ultimate. And um, that's my prerequisite. But, you know, the first thing I'm all about it, you know, being a producer, a writer, an engineer, a mixer, a ranger, you know, I, I, the first thing I need to focus on is songs. You know, I'm, I'm all about great songs being mentored by people like Clive Davis and David Geffen. And... It's imperative, regardless of what type of music you're doing, whether it could be EDM, it could be rap, hip hop, uh, soul, R and B, rock, pop. There has to be a great song attached. It, that's so important. A song that is contemporary, because I'm all about today's generation. You know, when people look at my discography, they say, "Well, he was great this and that and then, but how do you stay relevant?" And the reason how I stay relevant is I never grew up. I'm still 16 years old. I like music kids like, you know? And my goal is, you know, when we're doing lyrics, that we have to understand that each generation has their own way of saying things. Like, uh, to give you an example, the Beatles wrote a number one hit called She Loves You, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. If you wrote a song like that today, people would laugh. You know, people today right now want to tap that ass. You know? Exactly. You know, want to hang out in the clubs. I want to be drinking this and that. You know, but the whole thing is, and my deal is, I want to be able to work on songs that can relate to today's generation, but at the same time, 20 years from now, it holds up and holds the test of time. That's so important. And that's my big thing about music today. 
is I love a lot of music today. I love bands like the Struts, you know, and obviously Muse has been around for a while. And I like pop artists too. But at the same time, how many of those pop songs are going to hold the test of time? You know, and, and, and that's the key is be able to make sure that today's generation relates to what you're doing. That is so key in how I, I, I compose music today and produce music today. I look at an artist when I work with an artist, I say, okay, what is your target audience? And I look at that target audience and say, hey, if we're dealing with demographics from 12 to 24, okay, this is what we have to do. If we're looking for 24 on, this is what we have to do. That's so important. Again, I deal with subject matters of what artists are writing, and I try to like put that in lyrics that people can relate to today. Does it get frustrating for you? Like you had a hand in Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, and of course that was a huge, huge album. Does it get frustrating when, after an album like that, the bands come in and the record company comes in? Because I, I, I know you just mentioned and keep saying, "Make us another one, make us another one." Do you find that like, okay, no, leave me alone? Is it frustrating to hear that? Not at all, because I understand the business side and I understand okay. the creative side. No, to me, you know, I've been very fortunate to, I would say, 99% of the bands I've worked with, I've made their best record, and that's not by coincidence. You know, um, you know, with Guns N' Roses, I really felt, and this is uh, no bullshit, that that's where I felt rock and roll needed to be in that time and space. Did I predict it would be one of the biggest rock and roll albums of all time? Hell no. But I felt that's where rock needed to be. And the same with Metallica. And the same with Soundgarden. And, 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 and so forth. Is that record companies have to be companies. At the end of the day, it's bottom line. And I, I agree with that. You know, when I'm in the studio today, I have to play a r guy. I have to play marketing guy. I have to play song guy. And I have to be... I have to play, you know, making sure the band makes noise. I have no problem doing that. I've done that my whole career, so that doesn't bother me. I, I love competition, and, and, and stuff like that doesn't bother me. For, for somebody who's listening to this and doesn't seem to understand or doesn't fully comprehend the difference, uh, what is the job of the mixer and what is the job of the producer? Because there are, there are titles where you've done both. Um, so how would you differentiate it for, for somebody who's listening? All right. Again, there are so many different types of producers that come from a lot of different types of schools. There are producers who came from an engineering background. There are producers that came from a songwriting background. You know, uh, and I can only explain what I do and personally because there's, there's so many things. When I'm in the role as a producer, I sit down with the demo songs I look at what they're talking about. I say, well, how do I make these songs great? And a lot of times, and again, I hate writing, but at the same time, I want to make sure that these artists make a statement with these songs. Then I'll go in with the bands. You know, we'll, we'll craft the songs. I'll work on the arrangements with the bands in pre-production, work on tempos, keys of the songs, uh, uh, arrangements, and dynamics of a song, and I'll do that. Then I'll go in the studio with them once we've prepared ourselves, knowing where we are to take these songs. Again, I don't want in pre-production where the band plays a song so many times they're sick of it. I want to make sure that they have the spark when they come in and do it for real. It's a great take. And, and, and that's how I approach, approach it on a producer side. Then I'll go and record them, uh, I'll work with an engineer on Pro Tools or whatever it be like that, you know, because I, um, I love working the console and I love engineering, but at the same time, I love to have a great engineer with me because I have a lot to do in the production side where, you know, paying attention to performances, that's a key. And not sit behind a screen and looking at a visual screen, seeing, you know, what's right or wrong because... I think a lot of people make the mistake of when you're dealing in a digital domain and you're recording a band, you're looking at a grid, which a grid is basically seeing how all the instruments fall in line of a tempo and making sure everything is perfect. And I find that to be terrible, especially for rock music, because it's all about feel and human emotion. 
and you cannot get feel and human emotion if all you're doing is looking at a screen and see if everything's perfect. You know, it's like with American Idol. Everybody deals with pitch perfect things, and that to me takes the human quality of a song. It's like you take Kurt Cobain, like Nirvana, and you decide to put an auto tune on his vocal. And for those people who don't know what auto tune is, it did. It basically pitch corrects every syllable a singer sings, which I find to be ludicrous because, you know, if you look at the best songs of all time, they're imperfect, and there's a reason why they're great, and there's a reason why they're imperfect. It takes that human emotion there. So that's what I tend to do. I remember working with a band, Blues Traveler. We did a song called Run Around. The original demo was about a 25-minute jam and was a ballad. So I took that idea they had, brought the tempo up, worked on the arrangement of the song, worked on the key of the song, and, and, you know, it did what it did. And, you know, as far as mixing goes, mixing is a different genre. Mixing is where the, the artist has created all the tracks of the songs, and they want somebody, it's almost like mixing a salad, putting the right ingredients in, where you, you take what they've done and sonically make it great. So basically, everything's been recorded. You come into a session, you put the tracks up and try to make it as great as it possibly can be. So it's a different thing there. I'm producing and mixing at two different entities. When, because I notice you've also gone back and done a few compilations, you know, the gold releases or the best ofs. Um, talk to me about the mixing in those situations, because you have the songs and they come from different albums and different producers and different eras. Uh, what do you look for there to make it sound as one? Well, it, it depends. You know, whether, you know, if it's dance music I worked on or album rock, you know, let, let's take two two specifics here. Like when I worked with Shout Tears and Fears of Talk Talk, It's My Life. I took the original production, added instrumentation to make it more exciting in a mixing sensibility. You know, to make an extended version for the club versions, whether it be Whitney Houston or Madonna, I would take the original production ideas, add my own musicians onto it, and make it more exciting. Whereas, say, I I, I, I mixed um, Cinderella, Long Cold Winter. You know, it's you know the, the the tracks were there. My my thing was to make it sound big, huge, dynamic. But what was there? So it wasn't. I mean, we did. Uh, I think at that point when we did that record, we did add some additional vocals by Tom and a couple of parts here and there. Sometimes when you're mixing uh, a band, you know they have they have the album ready and then they want to add stuff while you're mixing. So that's uh, that's uh, something that happens quite often. Always a challenge. Um, I look at some, uh, at your discography and I see Alice Cooper trash and I see Cheap Trick Rockford. Those are albums that came. I don't want to say at the twilight, but they came in the later part of their careers. And then, you know, you look at Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. I'm going to keep coming back to that one. Do you approach it differently when a band has been around and they're trying to recapture a sound or they're trying to, you know, put together something like Rockford as opposed to somebody who's fresh in the studio? Do you take more risks with like a Guns N' Roses at that time and say, ah, we've got some stuff we can try? Or do you approach the sessions similarly? To me, each session and each artist is different. Okay. I don't have an assembly line uh, assembly line approach to what I do with an artist uh, because I believe that each artist has had their own identity. Maybe I'm a, maybe I'm an anomaly in that respect because I know a lot of people out there that do like on the mixing end, they make everything sound the same. And my idea is, hey, the bottom line is the artists have to be who they are. They have to tour who they are, and they have to have their own identity. And it's more than about just putting out a record for a label. Artists today have to perform their stuff. They have to, you know, build their own following on their own. So that's very important to me. When you take a, a band like Appetite, I originally was going to produce the record, and this is where, what happened is that Tom Zutat from Geffen Records um, – I was working on Tesla's first record, Mechanical Resonance, and Tom kept sending me demos of Appetite for Destruction, and I absolutely fucking loved it. 
I mean, when I heard Welcome to the Jungle for a time, I said, I got to do this band. And the problem being why I didn't produce that, we were so burned. We were working on so many different parts. I said, Tom, I really love this band. I want to work in this band. But the time frame you want to do, we are absolutely burned. Why don't you find somebody to produce it and we'll mix it for you? So being with that said, we went into mixing the album. And I loved the approach we did on it. You know, Tom Zuta was great. He was in with the band. You know, Teresa Ensonod basically found the band for Tom. And Tom was great as an A&R guy because what I loved about Tom, he spent so much time with the band. You know, they worked on their songs, developing their crafts, babysat them, and got to a point where we started mixing Appetite in New York. Now, Appetite was mixed on no computers. It was all hands-on mixing, and uh, which was great because, you know, I, you know, I work with computers. I worked on the first, first Pro Tools. I'm all about technology. But at the end of the day, it's all about feel. You know, somebody can mix something in the box. I'll blow away their mixes in a second, mixing on a console, because mixing in a box is too mathematical and too predictable where, you know, I was, thank God that I was brought up in a generation where you were hands-on. And I don't know how many times I worked on consoles where the computer broke and I wound up mixing it manually without a computer. Because, you know, when people say, well, hey, let's bring the guitar up uh, 1 dB in, in the B-verse. It's not about 1 dB. You have to feel it. And, uh, you know, I close my eyes and I feel it on the console as far as mixing goes. Right. With and, Alice Cooper... Which I love that. By the way, Alice uh, may be a golf junkie. I, I'm going to have to go to rehab for golfing. You know, when he did the trash album, I believe Desmond Child wrote a lot of the songs. We worked up at Bearsville in, in, in New York. Right. Great studio. Legendary yeah, studio. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done so many great records. I love Bearsville. It was, it, even when I worked at Ozzy, there was an amazing studio. And um, what I loved about Alice is, is even though Alice has been around the block a couple of times, he always reinvented himself, always had the hunger and always had the drive. And that's what I love about an artist. So, you know, these people who say that, you know, because they were great then, why should they be, they be great now? It's all about having that hunger and, and, and evolving. And, and to me, that's the most important thing is that, you know, uh, with Alice, we worked on the songs till probably four in the morning. He'd wake my ass up about six or seven when we play 18 holes of golf at the Woodstock Country Club. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. And But I loved his passion to this day. He still puts on great shows. Oh, Alice is fantastic. So, so in terms of a, a rookie artist and a seasoned artist, it doesn't really matter what they've done. When they come to you, you sort of deal with them in that moment. It's what is Alice bringing to me today? Not what you've done the last twenty years, or that's that's sort of what you're saying. Then it's it's really about in the moment. Absolutely. Okay. Again, like I said before, is you work with an artist, say like Alice, and you say you're doing a record with him today. I said, Alice, what what audience are you trying to attract here? Are you trying to attract just the audience that you have, or do you want to expand it? It's like with corn. I hate to keep bringing corn back, but corn was a great example that they had a huge following. And my idea was I do not want to compromise their audience. I want to make their audience feel great about what we do. At the same time, I want to generate a, a, a new audience as well to put the two together. That's not an easy thing to do, but that's what I do. I do my homework. And uh, it's so important too is like you know the reason why Taylor Swift is is successful. She understood what audience she wanted and she wrote for them. That is key because at the end of the day, I can suggest every artist out there, you have to build your own brand. Don't expect record companies to do that. That's not what they do anymore. So make sure if if you're a band like a heavy rock band, say well. I say, what's your influence? He goes, well, five finger death punch. I said, well, guess what? If that's the type of style you're going for, you better do something better than them. Or why bother? That's what I do as a producer. Right. I want to see what their influences are and what they're trying to achieve, and I want to better what their competition is. Yeah, and and of course, for those who don't know, you did follow the leader and um, 
children of the corn with corn, which are yeah. I was funny. I I was in New York at the time, and I got three bands. My manager came up to me, so these are three bands want to work with you. Which ones you want to do? One was Corn, one was Buck Cherry, and one was Bolt Upright. And the only reason I passed on Buck Cherry is I did that before, even though I love them. And I wound up saying, okay, I'll do Corn. So I go to L.A., and Jeff Quance and Peter Katz were managing the band. We got together. And I went to meet the band, and I brought in a 12-pack of Coors Light because I knew that's what they like to drink. <laughs> so we got into a rehearsal situation where... You know, they were interviewing me, and at this time, you have to understand, they probably interviewed about four or 500 producers, and, and they were at the point where they said, you know, the hell with that. I don't want to go with another producer. I'm going to go back with Ross Robinson. So I kind of got that vibe, and at the, end of this, at the end of the meeting, I said, you know what, guys? I don't need you to break my career. If you want to make a serious record, call me, and I walked out. I get a call from their manager uh, probably an hour or two later, so oh, the guys are sorry, this and that. They want you to come in. I said, I'll tell you what. Let's go in. Let's go in a rehearsal situation. Let's pick one song and see if the chemistry works. So everybody was good. I get in the studio, and the first song we picked on was Freak on a Leash. <laughs> and Not a bad song to start off with. No. And, <laughs> and the funny thing was I, I took this song, and I rearranged it, had this to that. I said, you know, try this riff, you know, Monkey Head. David, this, Jonathan, this lyrically, and then we changed it around. We worked on the song for a couple hours, and everybody goes, wow, that was fucking great. We like you. And, you know, we wound up doing a gig together, and I spent two months co-writing with them in, in a rehearsal situation because I'm the type of guy, I don't want to go near a studio until I know we have the songs where they need to go because you waste a lot of time and effort and too much pressure being in the studio. Get it done on pre-production. So it was funny, you know, I get into, um, I get in the first day of rehearsal and I, again, this, uh, I, I'm thinking this is what happened. So I said, Hey guys, how do you guys really write songs? Uh, Fieldy plays a bass line. I said, cool. How else do you write songs? Uh, Fieldy plays a bass line. I said, okay. I said, uh, I said, head monkey. I want you to come up with some cool guitar licks. David drummer, come up with some cool drum grooves. Jonathan, come up with lyrics. I even brought Dre's, Dr. Dre's program in just to change up the writing style to get more creative. Because again, you know, I worked on um, Public Enemy and Anthrax, Bring on the Noise, and I worked on a lot of uh, rock hip hop stuff, which I absolutely love because I've always loved that style because I was a big hip hop fan because I worked with Public Enemy, Cypress Hill, Wu Tang, just the main couple. Love that genre. To be able to mix those two genres together, I thought it was special because I felt they both had the same same message, you know, aggressive and groove oriented. And uh, we wound up. I wanted to bring Be Real in from Cyprus, so we had a lot of guest artists on the Corn record, and it was very creative. And that's what I loved about it. I mean, I would write lyrics with Jonathan until six in the morning in the hotel room after a session. And we'd have a lot of people in the sessions, uh, whether it be uh, the guys from Primus Orgy, Marilyn Manson. So it, it was kind of a zoo in the sessions itself. But, you know, I feel we, we made a really great record with that record. Yeah, and I in think fact, I... it was funny. I got the life. I told David, I said, you got to play this disco beat on the drums. And he's like, are you fucking kidding me? At the end of the day, everybody loved it. <laughs> yeah, and it, it stood the test of time now. Now, I do want to ask you about certain specific albums, but before we get there, what are you currently doing? What, what is your, your sort of, are you working with Korn again? Are you working with any of these bands again? What is still No, I now? mean, I'm always open to that if it makes sense. You right. know, I'm doing a lot of things right now. Uh, in fact, I have a new manager, Doug Goldstein, which okay. I'm really excited about. Another, We're another putting, Guns N' Roses uh, a big thing together. I uh, wrote a movie. Obviously, besides my musical stuff, I also wrote a sports anthem. And I also developed a company called Live Famous, which is going to be... I can't really uh, divulge on what that's going to be, but basically it's going to resurrect the whole music industry. I'm also in the process of working with... Uh, a band called The Beautiful Disaster, 
who Michael Lando fronted. He's from Adrenaline Mob, Adrenaline Mob, and did Sonic Stomp one and two. And it's going to be uh, fronted by my friend Frank from Grand Slam, oh, great. who I've known forever. And he's such a big rock guy. And he called me up and said, dude, I want to do this label. Would you be interested in work with Mike? And I heard Mike's stuff. And I said, this guy's got so much potential. And so we're putting this together. I'm going to be working with him and also working with this band, Chris Lager, who uh, is a totally different side of the spectrum. Uh, I'm going to put together with Chris Lager. He's from Kansas City. And again, I like working on different genres. I don't know how to classify them. It's more like if you meld Blues Traveler with Warren Haynes type of thing, really good musical band, great riffs and cool grooves. In fact, I want to bring Warren Haynes in and maybe John Popper from Blues Traveler be great. to do that. And again, I wrote my movie, which is very important to me. It's called Souls, and it's going to be... And again, I'm a movie aficionado, so I don't do things lightly. It's going to be the number one blockbuster of all time. I can't divulge what it is, but trust me, you like Star Wars and everything like that, you'll be blown away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, if somebody wants to reach out to you to, 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 to hire you to mix or to produce, can they do that? Do, are, are you, can they reach you on a website or something and say, hey, Steve? Sure. Uh, Let me give you a couple things. First okay. of all, my website is stevethompsonproductions.com. Okay. And my manager is Doug Goldstein. I'll give you his email address. His email address is when pigs fly ENT at gmail dot com. That's W H E N P I G S F L Y E N T at Gmail dot com. And uh I'll give you my email address, it doesn't bother me. It's Thompson's Music 53 at Gmail. T H O M, like a Mary, P S O N S, music53 at gmail.com. You know, the one thing about me, everybody looks at my discography and they get intimidated. But, you know, I, I like to tell people I'm all about today and tomorrow. Forget about what I've done in the past. What I've done in the past is a great exercise, what I do in the future and more. I'm all about making music for today and tomorrow. That's what I do, whether it be, you know, any genre music. And you know, the bottom line is if you're looking to do what everybody else is doing and not make a statement, don't call me. If you want to be something that's special, that's something that attracts me. And again, whatever type of genre. You know, my, my goal today is to resurrect rock. Everybody says rock is dead. And we've been through this forever. Rock needs to have a new formula. And then the beauty is I know what the formula is because, you know, again, kids today, the majority of kids love EDM and I love EDM. Don't get me wrong. I've gone been to all the festivals and I love the energy that these shows do. You go to uh, all these festivals and you see all the energy that goes on. The light shows make Pink Floyd's light shows look tame. And, and, and I want to put that energy into rock music today. That That is my key. And, and again, if I could find the right bands that, that are willing to open up their minds and say, hey, we want to be relevant to the kids, I'm all for it. And, again, I love working with, you know, uh, bands that have been around for a while, you know. I mean, it was a great to work with Blondie and Cheap Trick. I mean, these are bands I grew up with. Yep. You know, I have to say one thing. If I had to say one artist that made me want to be in music was David Bowie. Yeah. I remember seeing David Bowie at a show, the Ziggy Stardust show, and that actually blew me away. And again, you have to understand, I saw Zeppelin live. I saw every major band live. Bowie made a difference. It just blew me away. What I loved about Bowie, and that probably describes my career, is he would do a record. It'd be so successful, his next record was totally different. And it was more successful. That's what I love about an artist, being able to evolve and to be able to translate. Because the bottom line is you want people to like what you do. And the whole thing is when you go in the studio, it's not about, well, I want to write a pop hit. Just concentrate on writing a great song that people will remember. That's all I, I say about it. The hell with don't go in the studio wanting to write a hit. It doesn't happen that way. Is it? And I've worked with the top songwriters in the world, you know. 
from the Diane Warrens to the Desmond Childs, everything like that. You know, they write these songs. I wound up co-writing with most of my artists I work with, and I hate doing it, but I wind up doing it anyway. Is it always important to evolve? Because I think of an artist like ACDC, and and I certainly don't want to say they haven't evolved at all, but but they sort of stick to what they do. It's meat and potatoes. It's ACDC. We know what it is. It's an anomaly. Trust me. Okay. They're the only band that could play the same three chords and, and do something cool. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so, okay, because cause I was just wondering. Now, uh, in terms of rock is dead, I've always sort of compared rock these days to sort of like jazz. You know, back in the 20s and 30s, that there was the jazz age, and then and now, you know, there's festivals, and there's Newport, and there's Montreal, and, and jazz is still around. It's, it's not die, but it's not in the media or on the radio. Like, it. Have we sort of reached that point with rock, where rock is sort of our generation's jazz? You have to understand two things. Right. First of all, you have to understand today's audience. Do you think kids today are going to want to like stuff that their parents like? Never. No. That doesn't happen. Okay, understand, their parents grew up with Zeppelin, Ozzy, and all this other shit, okay? Well, the good stuff. Yeah, all the good stuff. (laughs) So you can't do that. Right. You know, that's why hip-hop and rap is great, because they know damn well their kids are not going to get into it. In fact, I had people in my peers... And when I was working in hip hop, I had to this rock stuff. I said, why are, you, why are you into this shit? I said, easy. I like it. Okay? You know, the whole thing is you have to create a music that the parents are going to hate. And, I mean, if you look at a lot of the lyrics in today's pop music, the parents are going, oh, my God, I can't believe they said that. You look at Nicki Minaj, Anaconda. I mean, you can look at the pop list and see what they're singing. I mean, most rappers say you can't even understand what the hell they're saying. And, you know, a guy like Kanye, and I respect totally as being creative, but don't put this guy near a microphone. This guy has the worst fucking voice I've ever heard in my life, and stay away from a microphone. I remember when he did the Queen song, I want the fucking Earl. Same with uh, P. Diddy when he did uh, Cashmere by Zeppelin. Are you fucking kidding me? And again, that's my approach. I mean, uh, Jay-Z, I was in a studio in New York in the early 90s, and Jay-Z was doing his rap. He couldn't even rap on beat, okay? Jay-Z couldn't hold a fart candle to to artists like uh, 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 Public Enemy, N.W.A., Cypress Hill, uh, Eric B. and Rakim. But that's the state of the industry. You take a guy like Drake, who's very popular. Is he great? Well, obviously, kids love him, so I'm not going to even go there. <laughs> yeah. Now, all right, let me ask you about some of these these albums. Uh, most of the ones I'm going to mention, in fact, I think all the ones I'm going to mention, meant a lot to me uh, in my life. They, they had a, a great place. And I think one of the most controversial ones is Injustice for All by Metallica because people always Ouch. say there's no bass in the mix. There's no bass in the mix. What happened to the bass? You mixed it or... You were there as it was mixed, right? You, you were. Your name is on it as mixer. So, so, what's the story there? What happened? Is it as bad as some people say? Is it as good as others say? Talk to me. All right, let me it. let me give it to you from the horse's mouth. Even though I did expose my 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 thing, I think it was on Blabbermouth or something like that. I told the real story, and it was the number one trending thing on the internet when I told the story. And this is the God's honest truth. Understand two things. Uh, Cliff Bernstein and Peter Mensch were managing Metallica at the time. I was working with Tesla, and they wanted us to get involved mixing it. And me being a huge Metallica fan, I jumped on it. My thought was, after listening to Master Puppets, I wanted to make Master Puppets sound like a demo. That was my intention walking out on the project. So we did this album up in Bearsville, New York. And... The band, meaning Lars and James, were the only two guys in the band who fly in because they were on the Monsters of Rock tour, fly in to approve mixes. So the first day, I was working with Michael Barbiero, my partner at the time, and Lars came in and said, this is how I want my drums to sound. So he basically brought all the paperwork for all this EQ set up, how to set up the drums. So I told Barbiero, I said, Mike, why don't you work with Lars on the drum sound and get it where he likes it? So they spent hours on that. I walked in, I listened to it, and between me and you, I thought it sounded like ass. So 
So I kicked Lars out of the studio. I reshaped the whole drum sound, brought up the bass, guitars, worked it because, you know, the bass and guitars work great together. They're like a unison part that worked amazing. So I put everything else up, put the whole mix up and everything like that, and Headfield put the thumbs up. Lars comes walking into the studio, listens to uh, the track for about 10 or 15 seconds, and he says, stop. I said, what's the problem, Lars? He goes, what happened to my drum sound? And I looked at him, I said, something like the fact that he was serious. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it sounded crap. So I reshaped it. He says, first of all, get my drum sound back. So I had Barbio get his drum sound back, which I hated. And uh, he says, see the bass? I says, yeah. I said, he goes, take it down about 6 dB. And I, and I thought he was out of his mind. So I did that. So he did that. I said, now take it down about another 4 dB where you barely audibly can hear it. And I turned to James, and James threw his head, the hands up in the air like, are you kidding? And... So I called my manager that night, and I called Bernstein and Mensch that night. I said, guys, I love this band. I, I mean, this is my favorite band of this time. But what they're wanting me to do is, and again, at the end of the day, I agree, it's the artist record. So at the end of the day, you have to give the artist what you want. But my fucking name's going on it, and I totally disapprove what they want to do with it. So I said, maybe you're better off finding somebody else to mix this. So to make a long story short, they uh, convinced us to stay on the project, and we had to mix it that way. And it really bothered me. And the biggest thing that bothered me is I was so busy, I should have spent a couple of days myself just to mix it the way I heard it, just so I had it. But I didn't have that time luxury. And, and, the, and I didn't agree with the approach. I mean, there's a lot of people who love the record for what it is, and there's also a lot of people saying, where the hell's the bass? And my name's on it, so obviously Steve Thompson's at fault of that. And again, I will take blame if blame was needed to be taken, but I cannot take blame for something I totally agree with the critics saying. You know, but you know, at the end of the day, it's not my record. And then the funny part is when Metallica got elected to the Hall of Fame, they flew us in to go to the Hall of Fame. And I remember hanging out with Lars, and Lars goes, Hey, Steve, what happened to the bass in that record? Like, he didn't remember. I basically wanted to cold cock the motherfucker right there. <laughs> yeah, you're like, hey, wait a minute. Would you, would you yeah, like... I was going to say, would you like the chance now to remix it? Because like, the, the 30th anniversary... Absolutely. Is only like, okay. I mean, I'll tell you the truth. I can listen to a blindfold with no ears to make it sound better. Absolutely. But the only thing I'm worried about, number two... Everything was recorded, recorded on a multi-track tape, and there's about five million tape edits on the master reel. Now, I'm afraid you open up the tape box, all those uh, tape spikes are going to be done, and the master reel is probably going to be all shredded. <laughs> because it's, it's too interesting. So, in a sense, it's not really remixable. There, you, you... I don't know. I mean, that, that again, I don't know how, how, how those tape spices will hold up at the end of the day. I would love that. I even told Lars that night, give me some time. I would love to remix it because I guarantee you, I'll make Master of the Puppets sound small with that record. Yeah. But again, you, you know, I see that's the problem with Steve Thompson. You know, I, I, you know, I'm headstrong and I want to make artists overachieve. That's my goal is to make them really make their career. You know, if you're serious about your career, you want to work with me. If you're not serious, go work at McDonald's. Because the bottom line is, I, I want to make every artist I work with, I made them better than everybody else. And that's my, my game plan. You know, and it, it just drives me crazy, you know, that you have to deal with stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, boy, that album, I know that, you know, I think in what, in, I guess 2019, it'll be the 30th anniversary. A, a great remixed, remastered deluxe edition, I think, is what every fan dreams I of. I agree. Yeah. Talk, to, talk to the band. I'll, I'll be there in a second to do that. Uh, uh, it yeah. would give me justice just to hear it the way I want to hear it. Because it's great songs, great record. You know, and I'll tell you the truth, it's still selling a ton today. You know, the question is, uh, are they willing to do that? I'd be first on board. I think that would be great. Now, let me let me move on to another record that that to me, as we sit here in 2016, 
when I put it on, it still sounds fantastic. I love it from top to bottom, and that is Tesla's Mechanical Resonance. Now, on this, you weren't mixing. You were the producer. Uh, what was no, it like? I did mix it. We produced it, arranged it, and mixed it. Okay, you did everything. So, so I actually played th- a couple things on it. <laughs> oh, did you really? Okay, so let's get into all of that. Uh, first of all, I, I know the guys. I still speak to them. We we text each other and all that wonderful stuff. But but that album is it, flawless. I, I don't, and I hope they don't get insulted. But I don't think they've done better since then. Um, what was that like? You know, they were what were they called? Kid Wicked or something like that before. It, it, all right, let me give you the history. They were called City Kid. City Kid, that's right. Okay, and again, I, I, I thank Tom Zutat for turning me on to the band. So basically, how City Kid formed, they played me the demos, loved the band. And what I found strange is, again, that they had other producers before, but everybody wanted to get rid of the drummer. And I'm saying to myself, why would you do that? You know, because first of all, I don't break up a family. Even if they're weak links, which Troy was obviously not, the weak link, I, I'll make them all great. You know, that's what I, I hate to sound like Trump here. I, I, you know, my goal is to make them all great. And, um, you know, so I heard the band play in, in rehearsals, and I love them. I love their songs. And the first song we worked on is Modern Day Cowboy. <laughs> and the original chorus was, Modern Day Cowboy is a winner. And I, and I went to Barbie. I says, no, we can't have lyrics in a song like that. So we wound up rewriting the chorus with them called, uh, you know, it's a showdown in an old man's land and a cowboy, cowboy in modern day. So I think the lyrics came out a little better. Uh, and just, we just worked with the band of New York. And we decided to go for a very live, in-your-face feel with the band. And... Um, you know, we I think we did use click tracks, but not computerized, but we wanted to get the essence of the band. I remember on Easy Come, Easy Go, had this song, and we wound up doing a guitar intro, and that was basically because I heard Eruption by Van Halen. I said, why don't we do something like that with Tommy Skeo and Frankie Hanna on guitars, creating this intro before we get into Coming At You Live. I'm sorry, it was Coming At You Live, not Easy Come, Easy Go. My bad. And, um, we wound up doing that and, and, um, really love the songs. I mean, Frankie Hanna is, I mean, he's to me as close to Jimmy Page ever. I have so much respect uh, for his feel and playing. I mean, this guy is a fucking musical genius. And what I loved about Tommy Skeo, he was the metal side of the band. And I love the way the two played together because it gave the edge and it gave the musicality together. I remember I was mixing the record in Media Sound. Jeff Peck comes walking in, and here's Jeff Key says, I want him as my singer. I said, you can't have him as a singer. He's in Tesla, bro. <laughs> and I really felt that album was very special because this is a day when hair bands were the big thing, and Tesla was anything but a hair band. Great musicians, great players, and had great songs. You know, so it was a win-win. I mean, we had a great time producing it, working with them, co-writing with them, and I really loved that band. I mean, they, you know, obviously they're still doing great today. And again, um, I'm not going to get into the later records we did. We did, I think we produced three records for them. Mechanical Resonance. Uh, Great Radio Controversy. And Psychotic Supper, yeah. Yeah, which, which um, Psychotic Supper has that song on it. Uh, what's it called? Uh, free, uh, song, no, what's that song? Anyway, I'll think about it in a second. But I love all those, ba- I love all those records. And, and I love Tesla. I think they're, they're great. And, and Troy is a person that I, that I speak to the most. So I'm glad that uh, you, you kept him aboard because, uh, He's great. You know what great. The, the, the funny thing was? He was voted the number one rock drummer. And that's to show you how how producers are idiots. <laughs> you know? You can't see that jewel in the bunch. You know, the whole thing is they have a great chemistry together. If there's problems, deal with them. You know, but the bottom line is a band is like a family. Don't break them up. Just work with them. You know, uh, you know that's the whole thing. Let them be artists. At the same time, make sure that they have the right material. I mean, 
I mean, Mechanical Resonance is one of my favorite records. Oh, I mean, I love the honesty and, 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 and the in-your-face approach of it and the musicality of it. It's amazing. You know, Brian comes from the Paul McCartney School of Music. You know? I mean, he mimics Paul a lot of times. So, it, it was it, it, to me, it was a great chemistry. Oh, that, that album is flawless. Uh, another one that, that changed things for me, and we mentioned it a little bit before, was Alice Cooper's Trash. And that's the one that sort of... In fact, I think that's the one that put him back on the map. He, he had had a tough time early in the 80s, and this one really brought him to the next level. Was that one a little more complicated just because there were so many guest musicians in there? You had Tyler, Bon Jovi, Winger, uh, Hugh McDonald, Tom Hamill. I mean, is that more difficult when you've got to so get Al many... Petrelli, my man. Yeah, Al, of course. Uh, well, Al uh, formed Transmedia in Orchestra, which we did a lot of projects together. I love Al. He's fucking amazing. No, I don't. I don't say it was complicated because, again, I've known Desmond for a long time. He wrote a lot of the songs, and again, dealing with Alice. No, not at all. I just felt it was a great record for Alice. Great songs. Uh, what the hell was the single? Uh, Poison, uh, which Poison. was a great song. It still holds up today. Well, I think um, all of them do. Uh, House of Fire is great. Only my heart talking with with Stephen Tyler on it is is, is great. They're all great. And why am I not? Why didn't I do another album with Alice? What's wrong with him? <laughs> yeah, no. I, in fact, you should have because that that one. Was there any pressure on that one? Because he came back and did a couple of albums just before that. Uh, Raise your hist. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Raise your fist and yell, and, and so on and so forth. Was this sort of like okay? We need this one to be big and 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 sound. This is sort of his last kick at the can, or was it like, hey, we'll just it'll be what it'll no, be? No, I don't get that pressure in the studio. Okay. Uh, I just to sidestep you a minute, I remember doing Saliva's first record, and uh, the record company was ready to drop the band before I mix it. I said, why are you doing that? And um, I can make this record sound great. And I said, Bob, my left producer, and I think he did a great job. And, uh, you know, with your disease, I thought that was a great record for Saliva. And we wound up mixing it, and then it wound up, I think it's platinum now. It was a big record for them. No, I, I didn't feel that. I don't feel that pressure because, you know, the bottom line is it's, a, it's, it's my job to make it marketable at the same time not compromise the integrity of the artist. So I, I did not feel that pressure. Maybe Alice did, um, but I never felt that pressure when we were working on it. Um, an album that didn't do as well as, as expected, uh, Slash is Snake Pit. It's five right. o'clock somewhere. I've heard all kinds of different stories, and I, you know, I'm not going to start talking about. Was that a difficult album to make in the circumstance uh, in that whole Guns N' Roses bubble? Because here he is, sort of going out solo, and he's got this other stuff. And was that a hard one to to to, to work on? Was you know because the songs? Well, I mean, the songs re weren't really there, right? I mean, I don't want to be insulting, but yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, you know, again, understand the success of Guns N' Roses, and then Slash wants to, and Slash is such a talented musician, and I have so much respect for him. I, you know, uh, it's beyond belief. You know, obviously. When you have a singer like Axel, then you go to another. Who sang on Snake Pit again? Who's the uh, singer? Do Eric, Do Eric Dover, I believe. Right. Now, to me, Slash found his groove when he had, uh, what's his name now, uh, in, in Slash's band. Uh, God. Back then? No, now. Uh, now you've got Brent Fitz, you've got Miles Kennedy, you've got... Uh, Miles Kennedy. Right. I thought Miles was a great singer for Slash, and I think that's when he found his niche. Miles is a great singer for for what he does. Well, and again, no no uh, disrespect to the singer Slash Hughes. You have to understand, Slash is just going on his own. So you kind of kind of have to find yourself. You know what I mean? Was it the right songs, the right singer? Yeah, it's questionable. You know, uh, I, I don't want to say anything bad about it because Slash is a guy, he's like Keith Richards, always wants to work and always wants to keep evolving and doing stuff. So when you go on your own, you know, it takes time to really form your niche. It just doesn't happen overnight, you know? But, you know, as far as feeling the pressure, no, I, I didn't feel any pressure working on that record. Do you, Again, we just mixed it. We didn't produce it, so. 
does, does it happen often where you get into a situation, and I'm not referring to Slash here, where an artist comes in and the songs just aren't there and you're locked in either because of a contract or because of time commitments. You just got to go. And you, How do you deal with that? Do, 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 you, do you try to make well, that's, better? That's tough. Obviously, if I'm coming in as a mixer, I, 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 can, I can not put my input about singers, songs, or anything like that. I have to mix what's there. So obviously, obviously you're stuck with what they have. On a production end, totally different. I can more or less say my thing and say this is what we need. Okay? So there's two different aspects. You know, I've had bands where I thought, and I'm, again, I'm not going to mention names, where I said the singer's just not right for your band. You need to get it. And again, I'm the last person that wants to break up a band. But at the end of the day, it's a business and what's best for your band. I'm going to interject my comments. And I wound up changing singers a couple of times. I won't mention the bands and it actually worked out for the better. You don't want to have to do that. But at the same time, I know what I'm doing, uh, you know, as far as making music and being in the studio. And, you know, not to be cocky or anything like that. Nobody knows it better than me. And I will interject those thoughts. Right. And, and, and I guess you're... you're paid to have opinions, right? Otherwise, why would they hire you as a producer? If you're just going to sit there and and be a yes man, there's there's almost no point. Oh, uh, that's absolutely not me. No, I am. I think that's why Clive Davis loved me because I would go into meetings with Clive where his whole boardroom was in there with pens and paper and whatever Clive said, everybody clap their hands and go, you're the man, Clive. And then Clive would go to me. I said, this sucks, Clive. You know what I mean? I said, what are you thinking? <laughs> and that's, I think that's why Clive liked me. Again, I'm opinionated, but opinionated in a good sensibility. You know, I want to see... The artists that work with survive with, with, uh, without the corporate structure involved. That's and that's more important today than ever before. Don't rely on a record company. You know, basically what they're going to do is take half your money and maybe give you 15 minutes and that's it. It's my job to make these guys self-sufficient where they can build their own career. That's important to me, without relying on, on outside influences. Can an artist still build a career in this day and age? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, the beauty about nowadays is you have all the internet, all the online sites where you build the thing. But the bottom line is don't think you're a fucking star, okay? You know, you have to earn it, okay? You have to work for it. You have to see what your competition is. Why are you better than everybody else? Don't think because you look good and you have, you have a song that could be this or that. You ain't shit until you proved it, okay? Understand that. And, and you know, my, my goal in life is I want to find the new Led Zeppelins. I want to find the new Bowies. I want to find the new Pink Floyds, the new Stones, the new Beatles, the new Marvin Gaye's, or this and that. They're out there, but they need to be explored, you know? And the whole thing is that music is, is bigger than ever. Unfortunately, the record companies got greedy and dealt with streaming, which uh, is terrible for artists. But the fact is, streaming, for people don't know is you get paid for play. It's like radio play. It's not like they're buying your record. You know, record companies said, okay, we'll deal with a place like Spotify. Spotify will give the record company billions of dollars, and they don't translate to add into artists. For the reason being, artists do not have provisions in their contracts for streaming revenue, and that's the artist's fault. All artists need to update their contracts with companies to make sure they get revenue from these streaming sites. Right, and that'll be coming now that as people understand the technology and, and of course, as, as the lawyers understand the technology, that'll start filtering its way into contracts. Unfortunately, these bands from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they, they, they had no clue it was going to happen, right? So they're, they're kind of stuck until... No, I've, I've, I've reworked all my contracts to include digital rights, and I think Bernstein and Mensch were great. I mean, okay. they've done that forever, you know, to include all that, and that's what you have to do. The one fault I have is what bothers me, and again, it's not being a, a, a crybaby, that people have the ability to get anything they want for free, and I think that is killing music. And you have to understand, people out there think you're getting something for free. And again, you, you know, people out there think, well, these artists make tons of money, so they don't need our revenue. That's bullshit. If you want great music, pay for it. I mean, 
God. I mean, you're paying nine, you're, you're bitching about paying 99 cents for a song. Are you kidding me? When you could spend three dollars, five dollars on a cup of coffee that lasts five minutes? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, I know. I know. You I, know, the whole thing is you want better music. Be prepared to pay for it. It's not like it's killing you. You know, I, I'm a firm believer, and if you make music worth buying, people will buy it. And I think people have lost their way a little bit, just throwing shit out there, you know, you know, doing the Clone Wars. If Artist A, that's the kind of song we want to do, uh, that's what you're going to get. Strive to be a great artist. People will come follow you. They will come purchase you. It's been proven. But, you know, don't lower the bar that far. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, boy, there, there, there's so much more, but I'm going to finish with one album. But, but I mean, we, we, we haven't touched on the Staying Alive soundtrack, Madonna, uh, Grace Jones, Ice Cube. Uh, boy, it's, there's, two, there's two anthrax. We, we, we haven't talked about Dawkins. Um, but Guns N' Roses, since, since that's the news of the day, uh, Appetite for Destruction, we, we, we mentioned it a little bit briefly, but... What was that session like? There were so many stories of the band was a mess, they were going to get dropped, the mixes weren't sounding right originally, it, it wasn't going to go anywhere. Zutat was having a, a his, he was pulling his hair out, he couldn't get it done. And then, of course, it got done, and it's a masterpiece. So tell me a little bit about those sessions, those days. What, was it a disaster in the making that, that got saved? Was it, was it just great from the... What was your impression of the whole thing? Well, uh, again, I heard the demos. I still have the demos from Appetite. And um, when we got to mix the record, I think it came together. Um, I'll give, I, I remember, I think the first song I mixed was It's So Easy. And I remember, you know, the riff was coming in, the guitar line came in, and I jammed that fader up like it ripped your fucking head off when, when, when the guitars all kicked in. And I remember Slash listening. I mean, I played it back about 10 times and blew about four sets of speakers on playback. Because when I play back, I like putting it on 11. That's just me. And I mean, I don't know if you ever heard the Memorex commercial where you see the guy sitting and seeing the hair flies back. Mm -hmm. That was Slash when he heard it. Right, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, we had a lot to do in the mixing session. And we had specific ways. I mean, it was funny. Izzy was getting on the console trying to mix the song. I said, Izzy, just play guitar, okay? Stay away from that. <laughs> and we would mix everything by hand on faders and edit tape. And I remember when we did, um, what was it, Paradise City? There was a part in the song I did as goof. There was a part that goes, bruh, 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 take me home. Okay, that song right before it goes into the next change. And I had Bobby Arrow repeat that twice. So they go, bruh, 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 take me home. And they go, bruh, 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 take me home. We did that as a goof. And we put that into the mix. And Axel listened to it. He goes, I like that. Keep it in there. So that was kind of funny. We kept the drums a little more on the dry side, even though at that time in age, there was a lot of reverb going around and everything like that. We wound up doing some mobile dubs. Understand who was at the mix session. It was Zoot. It was Slash, Axel, and Izzy. Duff and, and Adler were in L.A. at the time. Okay. And uh, we, we, you know, we started mixing. I think it took us about two weeks to mix the record. And there was another point where, you know, Sweet Child of Mine, radio wanted it, but we had to edit it down. And that means I had to edit down some Slash guitar parts, which he wasn't too keen about. And he was pissed off that we did it, but I said, Slash, first of all, it's a single. It's not the version that's going to be on the album. The single will be here today and gone tomorrow, but at the end of the day, you have your version on the album. Did I like doing it? No, but I understand radio, and that's what they want. So, you know, it, it was simple like that. I remember Slash stayed over my house. I lived in Long Island at the time, and, um, you know, he came over the house, and it was about 9 o'clock in the morning. I wanted to go to the beach, so I wanted to bring Slash up, and he just wouldn't get up. So I put speakers uh, right by Slash there and blasted probably down payment blues by ACDC on 11. That woke him up. <laughs> yeah, that would you make know, him we up. We came very tight. And Axel in L.A., we became very tight. We used to hang out together a lot. 
And the, the interesting part about Appetite, I remember having a meeting with David Geffen. Now, understand, this album took about a year and a half to break. We probably released Welcome to the Jungle three times. And I'm sure you've heard the story that MTV was not going to get on it. But I think Zoot and the label went to MTV and said, hey, you got to do this. And they wound up finally MTV playing it at like the wee hours of the morning. And the phones lit up like well, you wouldn't believe. And that's what hit it. And then obviously Sweet Child of Mine is the song that broke the band. But what I loved about David, he didn't give up. David Geffen didn't give up on the band. I remember having uh, a get together with David Geffen. We sat down. And David would basically say, you know what, Steve? You know, Guns N' Roses is not my personal type of music. You know, I listen to Laura Nero, to Lennon or whatever. That's my flavor. But I really respect the people who work for me, that they can find bands like this. And I love his approach because he gave the people who work for him security. Well, be your own person and, and do what you have to do. I remember him pointed to a guy, an A&R guy in the company. He says, see that guy there? He hasn't done shit for me in two years, but I know he's going to come up with something good uh, uh, at some time. Six months later, that guy signs Nirvana. Okay? Not and that's what's signing. missing in record companies today. Obviously, ears. Obviously, A&R. And obviously, artist development. And I really feel, if you're going to be a record company, how about putting creative people in creative decisions, and you're going to sell more records than worrying about streaming and how much we could rape everything. Because again, people are willing to buy music, but I get the biggest complaint. Well, yeah, I like this artist, but there's only one song I like of this artist. Why buy the whole album? And, that, and that, my that... philosophy is if I'm going to make a record with an artist, I want every 10 songs to be great, but don't bother. You know, the difference between a pop artist like uh, Beyonce or Pink or whoever, Iggy Azalea, whoever's out there, they go on song by song, and they have like 20 different writers and 20 different producers. I said, are you kidding me? You know, they're not album artists. They just go by singles. And when you're dealing in the rock market, it's all about making a great album. Because, you know, a great album will make you tour forever, and you'll be able to live off that record. Yeah. And, 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 and you've made, God, I'm just looking at this list here, easily 100 great album. I mean, it's, it's just, it's nonstop. Um, we've done an hour. I think at some point we'll, we'll have to do a second hour because we still haven't talked about Cheap Trick, one of my top three bands, Cinderella, um, which I guess that must have been interesting because you had, uh, you know, the, the band was never happy with their drummer and they kept having to bring uh, different people in and uh, there's a story are there. About, are you talking about Cinderella? Yeah, yeah, Cinderella. Well, well, in fact, let me just ask you: what what was the deal with Cinderella? They never seemed content with Fred Curry. They always had to bring other people in. Um, what, well, again, let me explain one thing to you. And again, this is from my own personal experience: that a lot of producers want to take the shortcut. And again, I don't know if it was Kiefer or. Eric on, 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 on the drumming situation, but I've always had the ability to make musicians work in a band. I don't know what Curry's thing was. I never worked with him personally. So I don't know if he just couldn't do it. or just people didn't have the patience to work with him. I really don't know that. I know that the one thing about Cinderella, Kiefer is a motherfucker. He is such a great musician great voice. I don't even put him, even though they look like hair bands, they were more than a hair band. Great musicians, okay? I mean, I did Long Cold Winter. I mean, don't know what you got till it's gone. It's a classic ballad. It is. And I remember Keith, I used to fight with Keith all the time because he said, I put the guitars too loud in the mix all the time. And I remember that Keith wanted to call me Steve Heavy Hands Thompson. I said, dude, this is rock and roll. Put it in your face, bro. <laughs> so we kind of had that conflict together. But as far as the politics, why Curry wasn't playing, I am not sure. You know, some people, it's like the difference between Steven Adler and Matt Sorm. I look at it this way. Right. Matt Sorm is a fucking drum machine. Great drummer, 
But if you want that perfect shit going on, you got Matt. If you want swagger, you had Adler. And I come from the school of, of, of swagger over drum machine. Because, again, I work on the most technical bands in the world from Kraftwerk on down where everything had to be machine-based. I get that. But for a rock and roll band, I want swagger. You know, uh, again, with Adler's problems in the past, it was probably hard for him to tour. Matt came in, did a great job. I mean, I, I, I work with uh, Kenny Aronoff a lot, which is an amazing drummer. Yes, of course. And what I love about Kenny, Kenny adapts to all styles of music, and he's one of the best studio drummers I ever worked with. He will give me what I want. And one of the few drummers that will come in, I'll show him the charts, I'll show him the arrangement, and he'll write the chart of the drum part. I've never seen that in a drummer. And again, I've worked with the best from Omar Keem, Tony Thompson, you name it. I've worked with them all. Kenny will come in and map it out. Total professional. Loved him. Yeah, he's, he's great. And, and the name I was looking for on the Cinderella was uh, Cozy Powell, who came in on the Long Cold Winter Sessions. Um, well, you have uh, to understand about Cozy. I'll give you – I mean, uh, I, I listened to Jeff Beck back in the day, uh, Beck Bogart, Napsey. And I listened to uh, the Jeff Beck group, Rough and Ready, I believe Cozy and Truth. Cozy was playing on there, if I'm not mistaken. Hey, Co- I yeah. believe Cozy played drums, and he's a motherfucker. Love Cozy. Cozy, um, God rest his soul. Yeah. Great drummer. I mean, those couple of Jeff Beck albums, I mean, it was Truth, Rough and Ready, and, uh, and uh, Truth, Rough and Ready, and Peckola with Rod Stewart on there. Three amazing albums, great musicianship on all of them, especially Rough and Ready and, and, and Truth. I believe Cozy was playing drums. Why they got Cozy in, I am not sure. We, you know, we didn't address that issue because we were in a mixing stage at that point. Well, other than the fact that it's Cozy Powell, I mean, I think. I mean, uh, for, for, how can you? How can you lose? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, for for a young band out of Philly to say, "Hey, we got Cozy Powell on our on our album, or at least on the demos," I, I'm not actually sure. To, did he? Did any of his playing actually end up on the album? Do you know? I I, I believe. What so. Fred's? Well, Fred's, but Cozy's. Cozy's uh, playing ended up on Long Cold Winter, didn't it? I would assume so. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. How many years ago was that? But I assume that the, it was his drumming. Sure. Yeah. And then, anyway, there you go. The long departed uh, Cozy Powell. But uh, thank you for today. It's it's been an absolute. Uh, it's like a, it's like a master class, quite frankly, with all the the great information. Um, great pleasure. Yeah, I just want to say one thing to all the artists out there today. Absolutely. Don't be discouraged. You know, everybody says you can't do this, you can't do that, and everything like that. Music is like breathing. If you have that desire, don't let people squash your dreams because that's bullshit. Okay. What you need to do is go out and live your dream. Regardless of what people say, the opportunity is there. But, you know, again, make sure that you're able to do it and make a living at it. And for the reason being, come up with great songs, work with great people. And there's a lot of people out there who work in their basements on a laptop and things like that. I get it. You know, but the whole thing is, don't crush your dream. It's so important because... Music it will be around forever, and it's just a great vibe to be in. And again, if you're serious, and again, I don't work for free. I have to be on first one to say that. I will give my information again. Yes, if you want to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me through Doug Goldstein, and you can get a hold of me at Thompson's Music five three at gmail dot com. And Doug Goldstein is my manager. And if those of you who don't know, who Doug is. He managed uh, Guns N' Roses, great guy. And his website, uh, his uh, email address is whenpigsfly, E-N-T, at gmail.com. There you go. Thank you, Steve. It's absolute pleasure. Oh, my pleasure, too. And, and listen, have a great one, and hope everybody enjoys the show. Absolutely. And uh, I think at some point we'll, we'll have to do a part two. There, there's too much that we missed. Well, call me back in 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good one. You got it. Bye-bye. Bye. And there you have it, folks. My interview with producer and mixer Steve Thompson. Please head over to Google. Check out the name. He has touched the music and the lives of 
pretty much everybody. If there's a band that you liked, whether it was disco, metal, rock, pop, whatever, he's had a hand in it. And so uh, congratulations for him for that. And on that, I shall say uh, goodbye. And until next time, please check me out at Mitch Lafon on Twitter and also one-on-one Mitch Lafon on Facebook. Uh, thank you to Steve Thompson. And uh, there you go, folks. Bye for now.